Hello everyone and welcome back to another very special episode of Matt Lown Plays Kerbal Space Program and uploads the footage to the internet. For this week, the new KSP update has just come out, which truly breaks ground because it finally, at long last, adds stock propellers to the game. And I know that the new DLC kind of added stock props anyway because it included motors that could have wing pieces attached to them, but now we have actual turboprop engines with propeller pieces. Now, this video will not be part of my ongoing LAN Aerospace 2, the second one, science playthrough series because the new parts are part of the Breaking Ground DLC and in that series I'm avoiding all of the expansion packs and I also wanted to make use of some of the higher tech tree tier pieces to make this mission uh, the best it could possibly be. So what are we building here? It's an electric aircraft fitted out with all of the science equipment in the game and ample room for two Kerbals to live uh, cosily <laughs> inside. One of my most popular videos to this day was the time I sent a nuclear powered aircraft to EVE, but in that episode I had to use modded pieces since up until now the only stock engines that could power aircraft on EVE were the horribly inefficient and overly powerful rocket engines. But now we have propellers, which will work an absolute charm in the thick atmosphere of EVE. I had to decide whether or not I wanted the aircraft to run on electricity or liquid fuel since we have liquid fuel powered rotors and we have electric rotors and as you might be able to tell at this point I ultimately opted to go with electricity just because with solar panels and RTGs to recharge our batteries, this aircraft has a theoretically infinite range. To achieve a similar state with liquid fuel engines, we'd need to lug heavy mining equipment around with us to synthesize new fuel as we go, which isn't as easy or ideal for craft of this form factor. So with this aircraft here, we can theoretically get science from every single biome of EVE, with the exception of surface data from its oceans. We'd of course need to transmit the science back to the KSC rather than bring it back ourselves because unfortunately, as you might be able to tell, we don't have any means of physically getting off the surface and back into space with this craft, but hey, I'm sure the Blunderbirds may be able to step in at some point in the future and recover our brave pioneers and their science data. So what you're watching the construction of right now is the second iteration of this craft. Uh, the plane was the same, but the first version had like a different heat shield configuration, like far fewer heat shields. But I would just find that no matter what kind of configuration or layout I used for the heat shields, it would just spin out horribly and then explode from re-entry heating. So in the end, I had to, I just went overkill. I just went, I just got fed up with having this thing keep on spinning out of control and exploding due to the uh, heating of entering Eve's atmosphere, so I've got a lot of heat shields, and it did end up costing me quite a lot of my um, sanity when we get to Eve, because even with all of these heat shields, the thing would still spin out of control quite often, and the actual uh, method of detaching the heat shields was a real uh, test testing experience, to put it one way. Uh, it's very... Entering the atmosphere in this game is very, very arduous and not fun at all because heat shields in this game are either the wrong sort of shape and size, like the ablative ones, or just so awkward and cumbersome like the inflatable ones when it comes to detaching them that it's really, really difficult <laughs> to make a uh, craft that can enter Eve's atmosphere, unless, of course, they're very small craft. But if you want to return from the surface of Eve, generally your rockets are not very small. Anyway, speaking of Eve, you will kind of get to all of this as we get there. Speaking of Eve, we are just waiting for a transfer window to open up to us. So for getting to Eve, you want to have a look at the map screen. If you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Eve, the angle it forms at the sun would be 54 degrees uh, with Eve actually behind Kerbin. Usually when you do these transfer window angles, uh, the planet you want to go to is always ahead of Kerbin. Eve is the sole exception. It's 54 degrees behind Kerbin rather than ahead of Kerbin, if that makes Makes sense. So Eve will be kind of at the bottom of the map screen, to put it another way. But we're pretty much there. As you can see, I eyeballed it. If you want to be a bit more accurate, you can use things like transfer window planner or Kerbal alarm clock. But right now, it doesn't matter because we are on the way. So yes, we have a ridiculous <laughs> looking rocket here. Again, my first generation had far fewer heat shields and looked a lot more sensible, like it had a big fairing covering the payload. But because I had to have so many heat shields, to make my re-entry uh, possible. I keep saying re-entry even though we're not re-entering Eve's atmosphere because, you know, we hadn't, we didn't launch from Eve, but you, I hope you get what I'm talking about here. I don't know if I don't address it, someone will point it out in the comments, I'm just clearing the air right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just like, this was so difficult. This is one of the most difficult vessels I've had to try and get inside Eve's atmosphere. But again, like most Eve rockets are very, very difficult because they tend to want to flip 
usually they're very bottom heavy so they don't flip over that much if you just put some inflatable heat shields at the top and then lots at the bottom they tend to stay fairly steady but this thing being an aircraft it's not got the best aerodynamics for entering EU's atmosphere because you know of all the heat shields around it so it was difficult but I think it I think it worked okay in the end and you know since we don't need to worry about returning from EVE the rocket itself does not actually need to be very big I've just got two stages here one to get us kind of the majority of the way to curb in orbit and then the upper stage will get us all the way to EVE circularize at EVE and then ultimately deorbit ourselves so that's the plan and that's the conclusion of the first stage we've not got very much fuel left and there it goes I'm using the engine plate attachment piece there because I guess that's what you're supposed to use I never used to use it just out of habit because I got so used to not using it because engine plates were only added relatively recently like last year and I'd been playing the game a lot longer than that so I was just used to making my own interstage fairings for separating engines that were a different diameter to the fuel tank they were attached to but you know enough is enough I should probably start playing this game properly so uh yeah just going to do our circularization burn and then get ready to plan a uh, maneuver node that will get us all the way to eve uh, but there it goes there but yeah you know a lot of people have been asking where uh, life on lathe is and it's a real bummer i started that series when i did because i didn't know great breaking ground was going to come out at the time and breaking ground would have been the ideal series uh, to base life on lathe on because now we've got propellers so we can have long range ships that aren't dependent on liquid fuel flying around lathe uh, we could add lots more science stations on the ground like with all the deployable science units you know, and we could add, like, boats that have run on propellers, you know, like paddle steamers or just, you know, normal outboard engines or inboard engines. It, it, there was so much potential. I, I'm almost I, <laughs> I'm almost thinking about just rebooting Life on Lathe from the very beginning and just doing it all again. But I don't want to make things too repetitive. So maybe I'll just try and get back to where we were. So have a, a land base, a sea base and an orbiting base and just do all of that in one massive rocket in one go. Just so it would be like a, it'd be kind of a cool video because we be a gigantic rocket going to lathe uh, and then just sort of adding bits. So we don't need that jet powered uh, seaplane anymore because now we can have one with propellers that is much more efficient and more sensible when it comes to designing a craft realistically. And, you know, I guess the SSTO would still work, but I don't know, we could probably improve it using the folding pieces. I don't, I haven't really thought things too far through. All I know is that it would have been a much, I think it would have been a much stronger series had the DLC come out before I started it. But, you know, you live and learn, I suppose. But yeah, uh, a terrestrial aircraft on EVE is something I've wanted to do for a very long time. But as I said before, there's no, there was no real way of doing it without using the modded parts, specifically, mainly, I suppose, the nuclear engine mod uh, that added nuclear power jet engines, which were actually a real thing. Uh, I did make a video on this specific thing. If you are interested in finding out more, I won't spend too long rambling about that. You could also use the uh, propellers from mods, but if you're committed to using mods anyway, the nuclear engines are probably a bit cooler. But now we don't have to worry about mods. We have stock propellers in the game. So that's what we're going to do here. This would probably have been <laughs> like talking about uh, life on lathe being better suited to using the breaking ground parts. So would Expedition Eve. So maybe I should do like Expedition Eve again, but it wouldn't be like all cinematic like the original Expedition Eve. It would probably be, I don't know, more akin to Life on Lathe. So lots of commentaries talking about the methodology, uh, explaining how things were done as we do them, that sort of thing. Like one of the big uh, points in Expedition Eve was the little subplot of Jebediah on his little mission, driving across the surface of Eve, across tundras and you know, scouting out caves and mountains, that sort of thing. It might have been a much cooler, it might have been much cooler if he had like an aircraft to do that rather than a rover. The rover ended up working out quite well because when we're maneuvering in a cave, probably a little bit more difficult to do that <laughs> uh, in a plane. And also for Green Harvest, it worked out a little bit better to have a rover. But all things aside, we are now at Eve and we've deorbited ourselves. So I guess we can discuss the atmospheric entry. So what I've got here, as you can see, is a huge, huge cluster of heat shields to keep ourselves nice and protected, even if we spin out of control, which, spoiler alert, we do. You may, you may also notice that there's a few kind of weird cuts during our descent. That's because uh, things flipped out of control and I exploded, or when it came to 
detaching the heat shields, things glitched out and they just clipped it into the plane and then blew things up and destroyed it that way. This is why I will, I always refuse to play the game without the ability to quick save, especially for things like EVE, which are basically impossible because there's so much down to just random bad luck and Kraken attacks that you have to use quick saves in order to be successful, even if you do nothing wrong. You could just get some dumb glitch where the thing doesn't detach properly and it just clips into something. Like on this in, on this occasion, we managed to detach the upper shield successfully. Here I'm pressing F3 to make sure everything survived and everything did. Um, but yeah, that was like, it took a few attempts to get that. Sometimes it would just destroy the cockpit for some reason. Uh, what I'm going to do actually, I've put a link in the description. It was on my second channel as well if you're, if you're subscribed to that, which hopefully you are. Hey, yeah, yeah. Got some dank memes on that channel, mate. Uh, but I put a link to a kind of montage on my second channel. Uh, of showing all the failed attempts at detaching the heat shields, and it also includes some clips of the original version of this aircraft as well. So there we are. Beautiful textbook separation of all the parts there. Again, using F3 to make sure none of the elevons or something, a less obvious piece if it were destroyed, uh, is still there, and making sure those delicate rover arms on the undercarriage as well are safe. But there we go, I've got this drogue chute here just to help keep things steady. It was mainly there just to kind of help orient ourselves in the right direction when detaching the heat shields, but we didn't end up needing it. I guess it's a good sort of emergency break if you're not coming to a stop when you're landing and you're about to hit the ocean or something, but it's not really all that necessary. So yep, yeah, we are coming down over the ocean, so we're going to have to just cruise uh, towards the land in order to land, obviously. Uh, we have about 10,000 units of electric charge, which in hindsight is probably not enough. I mean, it's enough, but it means you have to land quite frequently in order to recharge your batteries. I guess you could climb to a really high altitude and then just cut the power of the motors and glide for a bit, and then the engines will just get recharged. The batteries, I should say, will get recharged by the RTGs and solar panels, but I don't know, it's a bit inconvenient. As you can see, this aircraft is a bit nose-heavy. Like, if you cut the power, it does tend to just nose-dive very quickly. So what I did initially... The motor's power, the motor power, is bound to the action group number six. So I was just using six to kind of cut the power and uh, engage the power again to kind of do a controlled descent that way. In the end, I just left it permanently turned on and just used the brake toggle because I wanted the brakes to be on by the time I touched down so that we'd slow down sufficiently. But I didn't realize at the time that the brakes action group also applies to motors. So maybe in the vehicle assembly building, make sure it isn't. But actually, now I'm used to it. It, it works quite well when it comes to controlling your descent. So I'm going to slow things down to real-time speed now. And there we are. Beautiful touchdown. One thing to be careful of if you're trying to fly this craft yourself is those front propeller blades come very close to the ground. So you really don't want to be kind of landing on too much of an upward slope. Otherwise, they'll just get destroyed. But there is the plane all landed. Look at that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you could tell, but I played the footage back very, very quickly there because it doesn't exactly move at blazing speeds uh, when coasting through the atmosphere. And, you know, we really needed to get to the ocean. So a bit of a boring descent. So I did try and speed the footage up. But now we can get to the actual crux of the mission, which is doing some science. So first we can run all of our experiments, then hop down to the surface to grab a surface sample. And of course, plant our flag and it's the old Lown Aerospace flag because we're still in the old Lown Aerospace save because the new save, you know, we haven't got all the parts unlocked yet. And as you may notice, we needed some of the higher tech tree tier pieces for this mission to work, uh, at least, you know, to the extent I wanted it to. Now the Kerbals we've got, uh, we've got one scientist and one engineer so that the scientist can deploy the science equipment and the engineer can deploy the power equipment. When engineers deploy power equipment, the power equipment tends to generate, well it does generate more electricity and when the scientist deploys the science equipment, it generates a little bit more science. So that's kind of why I've got t these two Kerbals here. Obviously the downside to only having a scientist and an engineer is that we have no pilot so on the way to EVE, we couldn't make a maneuver node unless we had a direct connection to the Kerbal Space Center, hence why there was that gigantic dish that was attached to like the uh, truss structure that the heat shields were on, just so that we could definitely maintain connection to the Kerbal Space Center at all times. But now we're on the surface of EVE, maneuver nodes are not really relevant because we're in an aircraft, so we don't need maneuver nodes. Uh, but nonetheless, we do still have a big satellite dish on the back, just so we can, I don't know, transmit data back or uh, they can Skype their loved ones. Skype their loved ones? What year is it? Discord their loved ones, I think we all know. So, we've done some science here. Let's try and use this plane to its full potential and travel to another biome. So here you can see we are in the Midlands. 
we're going to go find another spot to do some science at. So we'll leave the field science down there because quite frankly I couldn't be bothered to pick it all up and take it somewhere else. And besides, the beauty of the field science is it will carry on working whilst we're away from it. So we will carry on farming some science from the Midlands. But now we need to find another place to do some science. Here you can see me playing around with the, the throttle of the engines, just trying to get a nice cruising speed. And then we're just going to have a look on the horizon. What I did was I just kind of scanned for an area that looked noticeably like different to the area we were in. The obvious one would be the ocean. We could have rolled down the hill a bit and got some data from the shores, but you know, we could go somewhere else as well. Lovely little panning shot using camera tools there, and there's another one. I set the relative velocity to be a little bit lower so we could get a nice, slow, smooth, cinematic pan by of the craft. And then I guess we can crossfade here. So I, I, I saw an area, I, I thought it was more obvious in the footage at the time, but I saw an area that looked a bit lower than the rest of the land around it. So I figured that's probably the lowlands biome. And lo and behold, that was almost a pun, I hope. <laughs> lo and behold, it was the lowlands biome. So we're going to just coast down nice and gently until we come to a gentle touchdown. Look at that. Beautiful. And as you can see, our biome, I'm looking at the biome reader on the top right in the Kerbal Engineer, our biome has literally just changed during our slowdown on the surface. We changed from lowlands to shallows. So it's only going to be like literally a 10 second waddle up the hill again to get some lowlands data as well. So very, very good spot here to get uh, lots of science from Eve. Uh, we're going to run all of our experiments again. This is another reason to bring a scientist Kerbal so that you can use your science junior and mystery goo units more than once. Uh, and then, you know, we can always do a turn around and go up the hill a bit and then we can do this all again in the lowlands. So that's what I was doing there. I was just restoring the mystery goo and science junior units and we can just board the ship again and run the experiments uh, and then we can get out on EVA and take the data again. And that's pretty much this biome all done. Uh, you can actually take surface samples from the wing weirdly i don't know if i that might have been in the footage i crossfaded over from uh, but you can take kind of eva reports and oh never mind i'm getting the eva report here and then we'll be taking a surface sample as well there it is surface sample from eve's shallows and then we can get back on the ship and get ready to go somewhere else so we can do a nice cinematic launch this thing launches off the ground beautifully in eve's atmosphere because these atmospheres are so thick it's very very easy to get aircraft into the air but you know I think you probably get the gist of what we're doing here. I'm sure you're happy to watch our brave Kerbals go off on their adventure in search of new frontiers, new science, and all of that. But we're going to leave it there, guys, for this mission. Uh, there's an end screen presence now. <laughs> on screen on the left is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. The one on the right is just my most recent upload. There are also links to the Patreons and to subscribe on the screen. And in the description, you'll find links to the Instagram, Discord, Twitter, all that good stuff, and the merch, of course. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.